I believe in the sun I believe in the risen one I believe I right. You guys can have a seat. Freedom. It's something we cherish in this country. The idea of a free society is embedded into the very core of our nation. Many have died defending it, and many have fought diligently to preserve it. So where has it gone? We've become a nation bound by division, chained by hatred, and consumed by selfishness. There's an epidemic of violence, poverty, brokenness. Does this look like freedom? The Bible tells us we're called to be free, but it also says to use that freedom to serve one another humbly in love. Maybe that's what we're missing in America. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. Perhaps it's time we recognize that true independence is found only in a lasting dependence on God. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Good morning, and happy Independence Day weekend. And we hope that you will rejoice in the freedoms that we still have in this country, but also we pray 
that you can also celebrate um, the freedom that we have in Christ on this Independence Day weekend as well. Thank you for gathering with us and worshiping with us today. I am, uh, my name is Sheila Kershack. I'm in charge of children's ministry here at Edgewood. If you'd like to know more about what God's doing at Edgewood, and he is on the move, doing amazing things, and we praise him for that, you can find out more about how to connect with us by filling out that connection card that's in the seat back in front of you. If you are joining us online, you can hop over to uh, edgewoodbaptist.net and fill out our online connection card. Did, are you aware that VBS is one of the most effective evangelistic ministries that churches can do? It's been around for a long time, but it is an amazing opportunity to reach kids with the gospel of Christ. And we are all about that here at Edgewood. In fact, I often say, you know, school is, is out, but church is on. And so we are excited about our Super Summer Slam, which is taking place this summer, July 21st through the 23rd, uh, 9 in the morning till 1230 in the afternoon. It's for kids three years through uh, sixth grade. And we are excited about our theme, which is Zoomerang. We're gonna be pretend hanging out in Australia and learning about how God values life and about the wonder of life from the pre-born through eternal life with Jesus. How appropriate, right? And in just the right time frame, because God never makes a mistake and he knows what's going to happen and he has um, allowed us to do this program this summer and just to help our kids to understand that God loves all of us and we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. If you would like to register your kids for our Zoomerang for Super Summer Slam, you can do that by stepping to the Action Center out in the hallway here and sign them up that way. You can jump on the website or on the app. You can also come downstairs and register them on the lower level, level near the child check-in desk. We would love to have them be a part of this. We're looking at record numbers this summer, which we are excited excited about. Um, in that vein, we uh, would like to present to you some opportunities to be part, yeah, don't snicker. <laughs> Opportun you knew that was coming, somebody said. Some opportunities to be part of these amazing three days. We have a different format. We're doing three days in a row. We're very excited about this. We have some opportunities for some people to hang out with our preschoolers. You know who you are, special breed of people who love preschoolers, and we would love to have you be part of our preschool team. We also are looking for people, there's no prep involved, you just show up and you get to be a group guide and go around and travel with our, um, our, our students. And just you will just enjoy it. It's a great time. You get a free t-shirt by the way, and three amazing days of ministering to the children who are part of our um, Super Summer Slam. We also want to mention that we are going to have a summer outdoor baptism service on August 14th at three in the afternoon at the home of Tom and Sue Hammer. We would love if you know that your next step in following Christ is to be baptized. We would love for you to be a part of this special outdoor baptism. And the way to let us know that you would be interested in that is on your connection card or on your next steps card that's also in your, your seat front in, in front of you. You can uh, get a, hop online or on the app to show your interest in that and someone will be contacting you about that. If you need further information about anything that I've talked about today or I've mentioned, you can head to those places as well, the website, the app, or the Action Center, or grab one of the staff to ask them questions about the things that are coming up. If you came today prepared to give, or you have a connection card, or a prayer card, or a, um, a Next Steps card, you can drop those things in the giving boxes in the lobby. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Thanks so much, Sheila. I invite you to stand back up. 
We're going to now sing uh, Psalm 113. Uh, not only is it a great to sing scripture, uh, but today we'll be later in the service, we'll be celebrating communion. And the reason why Psalm 113 ties in so well with a communion service is because it's, uh, it's part of a group of psalms called the Hallel Psalms. So Hallel in, as in hallelujah, the praise psalms. And uh, Jesus, when he uh, started the Lord's Supper, the night he was betrayed, right? The, uh, the Last Supper was, uh, uh, tradition has it that uh, during the, that meal, they would, uh, you would sing the Hallel Psalms. You would sing it. Now, obviously, the melody we'll be singing wasn't the melody they sang. The language we're singing isn't the language they sang. Uh, but it ties in. It's great to think of Jesus and his disciples singing these words uh, in praise of our God. So let's sing them together. Sing praise, O servants of the Lord. Sing praise to the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, both now and forevermore. Sing praise, O servants of the Lord. Sing praise, O oh servants of the Lord. Sing praise, O oh servants of the Lord. Sing praise to the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, both now and forever. He seats them higher still To the home He gives a legacy Sing praise, O servants of the Lord Sing praise to the name of the Lord Blessed be the name of the Lord Both now
Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that we could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be? The light within our midst, it is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal? And open the scroll The Lion of Judah Who conquered the grave He is David's root And the Lamb who died To ransom the slave Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory Is he worthy? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David Drood and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe every nation and tongue he has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son is he worthy is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory is he worthy is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Let's just bow our hearts and go to him in prayer now. Jesus, you are worthy. You're worthy to open the scrolls as the book of Revelation shares. You are worthy of all praise, honor, glory, power. All of history points to you, Jesus. In you are all things, and from you come all things. Oh, you deserve our praise. Jesus, we want to give it to you today, but not just through song. God, we want to praise you, glorify you, worship you through our lives. So 
as we open your word now, would you grow us so that we can be better worshipers, so that we can know you more, know your heart more. And we, praise the, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm happy to report today that Pastor Dan went home from the hospital on Tuesday night. Yeah. Thank you so much for praying for him. On Friday, he went out for a walk around his house. Yesterday, he went for a walk that was a mile long and was able to do that. He's uh, working now on getting better. Continue to pray uh, and support them as God leads you. I uh, also wanted to just pass along some family news. Earla Mink, longtime member of Edgewood, went to be with Jesus uh, yesterday morning. Hey, have you ever become aware of a problem and just put off taking care of it? Uh, anyone? <laughs> a couple of months ago, I noticed some significant corrosion going on at the top of our water heater. It's like where the cold water line comes in. And I kept thinking, I should probably get that checked out. Uh, But I didn't. Oh, I'd walk by, and every week or so, I'd take a closer look, and I'm like, I should probably address that. But I thought, that's going to be a hassle. It's going to be probably more expensive than I want it to be. Well, finally, after visions of a burst water heater began appearing in my dreams at night, (laughs) I thought I needed to call a professional to come and look at it. So this week, I met him at the door, and I prepped him for what he was going to see. You see, I was a little embarrassed. I said, you know, could you promise not to laugh when you see this situation? And he told me he's seen almost everything, and he promised to not laugh. So we went downstairs. I showed him the issue. He took his phone out, turned his flashlight on, leaned forward, took a closer look. I held my breath, and he remained stoic. And then he lost it. (laughs) He started laughing so hard his shoulders were heaving. You're going, I wonder what he was looking at. Well, I guess I should show it to you so you can laugh along with him. So after composing himself, he recommended a course of action to resolve the problem. He explained that a slow leak had caused considerable corrosion and actually had weakened the fitting. Okay, you can stop laughing at me and let me now ask, a few uncomfortable questions. Do you have a slow leak going on in your life? Has compromise caused some corrosion to be taking place in your soul? Maybe even coming to church, you're in a battle because you're like, "Eh, I kind of like doing what I'm doing, or I'm in a bad spot, I don't want to change, it's going to cost something, it's going to be a hassle, and uh, so is some of that going on in your life? Do you you know you need to address it? And you're like, I don't even want to open that, I don't even want to look at it. Well, this summer, we've been studying biblical concepts that begin with the letters R, E. And last weekend, we defined repentance this way, turning from sin to the Savior, resulting in a change of attitude, a change of affection, who we love, and a change of action. 
So repentance involves both a turning away from sin and a turning to or returning to the Savior. Now, we never know how the Holy Spirit works as his word is preached, but we know he does, right? So last weekend, I sensed the Holy Spirit, especially at work in my heart, and, and I sensed it in many of yours. I, I mean, I don't know that for sure, except this week, several people reached out and said, hey, I repented of this sin, and now I'm doing this. I made a hard phone call after hearing that message, and I thought, Lord, what were you doing last weekend? And I wonder what you want to do today, this weekend. And so in one sense, we could look at today's message as a follow-up to last weekend because the, the words are closely related. To return implies physical movement. It means to turn, to go back and do again. It's the idea of turning from evil and turning to the good. It was also used in the Bible to refer to returning home. Speaking of returning, we're going to return to a small book found at the end of the Old Testament from the prophet Joel. We studied this book in late May. One of the recurring themes in this book is the call to repent in light of the devastation caused by locusts, which were both real and representative. Representative of what? Well, of armies coming into the land and of the day of the Lord. You see, Joel is the first prophet to develop the apocalyptic event referred to as the day of the Lord. So before we get to our passage, let's set the context. The context is the devastation caused by the locust and the coming destruction triggered by the day of the Lord. Because of how God's people were living, he needed to get their attention in a big way. And so he sent locusts and he told them that there's a day coming referred to as the day of the Lord, a time of future judgment. Listen then to Joel chapter 1, verse 15. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and as destruction from the Almighty, it comes let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? For the day of the Lord is coming. It's near. Look over at Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? Here it is again. For the day of the Lord is coming. It's near. And it's going to be a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So when trumpets were blown like that, in our culture, it's like an air raid siren. It's like bad stuff is coming. Now drop down to chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. Here it is again. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. And he asks the question, who can endure it? The answer is no one. You see, the day of the Lord will have its ultimate fulfillment during the great tribulation in event you don't want to be around for. Listen to this description of what the conquering Christ will do, Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, but let me back up to verse 13. He, referring to Jesus, who's sitting on a white horse, he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he's called is the word of God, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Verse 15, 
From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah, amen is right. So the day of the Lord will have its fulfillment in the great tribulation. So the plague of locusts, Joel is saying, is severe. But the day of the Lord, it will be horrific. It will be horrific for those who are not saved. Malachi 3 verse 2 says, But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears. Now I'm thrilled that Edgewood will be hosting a prophecy conference coming up in the month of September, September 16th through 18th. We're calling it Living Now in Light of Forever. And the purpose of biblical prophecy is far more than just knowing the main events of the future. No, biblical prophecy is to teach us how we should live, listen, now in the light of forever. Dr. Ray Pritchard will be preaching that weekend. Dr. Michael Radelnik will be speaking Friday night. And then on Saturday morning, right here in the worship center, he'll be live hosting Moody Radio's open line, which goes out across the country. Levi Hazen, Jared Hall, Jason Crosby, and I will also be speaking. Now, many of you have already tried to register for that event. Uh, we're having some issues with the registration software, so check back. We hope to have that fixed soon. Just go to edgewoodbaptist.net. You'll be hearing more about that. Here's our main idea for the message today. Because Jesus will return one day, we must return to the Lord today, right now. Well, let's begin with how we're to return to the Lord. So what I've said so far all sets up these two verses. Here's where we're going to spend our time together today. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Yet, even now, the immediate context, the coming day of the Lord, the locust, hear God's heart, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning and rend your hearts and not your garments. That word yet tells us it's not too late. Whatever you've done, whatever you've been doing, whatever's going on, it's not too late to return right now. And in the midst of this looming judgment, we have a window in which to return before catastrophe strikes. The idea is we're to do so immediately and without delay. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Acts 17, 30, listen to the urgency, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Friends, write this down. The time to return to the Lord is always now. Right now. Not tomorrow. Not after you have a good time and you think, well, when I'm older, I'll, I'll, I'll return to him. No, right now. Even now, Joel says, when things are falling apart, God longs for us. He aches for us to return to him. We see a similar appeal. Check out Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. You see, ultimately, God's retribution is designed to be redemptive. Oh, would you note this appeal comes directly from the Lord. That's the unpronounceable name. That's the name Yahweh. 
the self-existent, covenant-keeping God. And so the one who has eternal pre-existence is also personally present with us. He's the God who existed in eternity past, and he's present in the present. Revelation eleven seventeen. we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you've taken your great power and you have begun to reign. I'm just going to walk through this passage. We're given seven or five traits to exhibit when we return to him. Number one, we're to return with our whole heart. Our return must be give, begin internally, on the inside, in our heart. We're called to engage with our entire heart. Lamentations 340, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Most of us aren't very good at that, but we're called to Take a look inside. We're called to test and to examine and then to return to the Lord. We're to do a personal inventory and then return not half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly. Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Notice next, we're to return with fasting. Oh, the purpose of fasting is to deny the flesh, not just of food, but of other cravings. The idea behind fasting is to starve the junk out, to spiritually detoxify, if you will, so we can hunger and thirst for righteousness. I love this insight from a pastor. The purpose of fasting should be to take your eyes off the things of this world to focus completely on God. Fasting is a way to demonstrate to God and to ourselves that we're serious about our relationship with him. Notice next, we're to return with weeping. When we come face to face with our transgressions, it should cause us to tear up and to weep. I talked to someone recently and he said, Whenever I think about God, whenever I read the Bible, I just start crying. He goes, what's wrong with me? I said, there's nothing wrong with you. What's wrong with me that I'm not doing that? You see, we're to approach him with this sense of tenderness and brokenness. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Next, we're to return with mourning. That's the idea of wailing and lamenting. Finally, with a torn heart. That word rend, we don't use that word rend much, but it means to tear or rip apart. The rending of garments was to represent the broken heart of the mourner and was an expression of uncontrollable grief, terror, or even horror. See, it was common for people to wear a sackcloth. I couldn't find exact sackcloth, but this is like burlap, but it's really rough. Actually, what they would wear was made out of goat's hair, like a black goat. His hair, very rough, very coarse. They would wear this next to their skin in order to cause chafing and even open sores. And then they would take their garments and they would actually tear them as a sign of their heart being torn apart. And some of you going through grief, you know what that's like. Well, the other thing they would do is they would take ashes and smear the ashes on their head and even on their face. Now, initially, when you trace the practice, when they first started, when God's people first started doing those outward signs, they reflected an inner reality. But over time, as happens with people, it just became a ritual. It just became something that they just kind of did without their heart being engaged. Okay, so that's the back story. What God wants from us today isn't so much that we tear our clothes that we tear our hearts. 
Isaiah, or Psalm 51, verse 17, God wants us broken and contrite. Most of us don't like to be broken. <laughs> we don't like to be contrite. We feel vulnerable. We're like, what's going on? But listen, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, often said this about his own preaching. Quote, my grand point in preaching is to break the hard heart and heal the broken one. Mm. Another pastor put it like this, the goal of preaching is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. You see, some of us are way too comfortable with how we're doing when inside we're a bunch of corrosion going on and, and the preaching of God's word should afflict us, should cause us to be convicted and to be repentant and others of us come in to a room like this or engaging online and you've just been afflicted, you're already broken. And God, through his word, can bring, and I hope he is bringing comfort to you today. You see, because Jesus will return one day, we must return to him today. First, we're called to be contrite. Number two, we're called to believe God's character. Verse 13 answers why we can return. We can return because of who God is. Oh, check this out. I can't wait to read this to you. Return to the Lord your God. Why? For he's gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger. And he's abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. That word your refers to personal possession, indicating belonging. That phrase, Lord your God, is used to speak of a right relationship with him. Aren't you glad that the God we serve is both powerful and personal? <laughs> well, let's go back in our minds to the time Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. As you may recall, because he was gone a long time, the people down at the bottom of the mountain are like, where'd he go? Where's Moses? Shouldn't he be back by now? Well, they became restless. Actually, their sin started expressing itself. They turned to Aaron, and they're like, Aaron, make us a God. Make us gods, plural. We need a God to worship. Aaron's like, all right, you got any gold? Let's throw it in the fire. Let's build it. Out comes, this is his words, out comes this golden calf. We know he made the golden calf for the people to worship while Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. Well, God knew what was happening. And this lit God up. And so he said to Moses, I'm going to consume them in my righteous and holy wrath. So what does Moses do? He immediately intercedes on behalf of the people. He asks God to turn from his burning anger and to relent from the disaster he had planned. <laughs> okay, and then we read what happens next. Moses comes down the mountain and he's carrying the tablets. He comes down, he hears them all partying, worshiping the golden calf and doing other things they should not be doing. He comes down from the mountain. He gets hot. <laughs> Moses is now angry. So what's he do with the tablets? Throws them on the ground. He breaks them into pieces. He gets the golden calf and he burns it with fire. He grinds it to powder. He scatters the ashes into water. And then he makes them drink the water. He is lit up. And then he called them to choose whether or not they're going to follow the Lord. And because of their spiritual corrosion, many persisted in their rebellion. And God sent a deadly plague and wiped them out. Now, all that 
is to lead to this. Before leaving Sinai, Moses has a question for God. He says, God, show me your glory. God, show me, give me a fresh glimpse of your glory. I want you to listen to how God responds, Exodus 33, 19. I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Did you catch that? God's glory is connected to his goodness. And after making some new tablets of stone, the Lord descended in the cloud. He stood with Moses and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And I'm sure Moses is shaking in his sandals. He's just asked God to reveal himself. And I wonder if Moses is thinking God's going to come down like in fire in this awesome display of his majesty and his holiness and his splendor. Listen to how God reveals himself. It's surprising, startling even. The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. That would have gotten Moses' attention. And then the Lord spells out the meaning of his name in words whose sweetness has never been surpassed. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Yeah, amen is right. God is so good and he's so gracious. I've been helped in my understanding of this, co- this encounter with the Almighty from a book. I've recommended it before. It's called Gentle and Lowly, written by Dane Ortland. The deacon studied this book for over a year. Check this out. When we speak of God's glory, we're speaking of who God is, what he is like, his distinctive resplendence. Our deepest instincts expect him to be thundering, gavel-swinging, judgment-relishing. Then Exodus 34 taps us on the shoulder, stops us in our tracks. The bent of God's heart is mercy. The first two words God uses to describe himself. This is God's self-revelation of his glory is that he is merciful and gracious. This description of God by God in Exodus 34 is quoted in Psalm 86, 15, Psalm 103, verse 8, watch this, and in Joel 2, 13. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over Disaster. Warren Wiersbe writes this, the one thing that encourages us to repent and return to the Lord is the character of God. God's like, this is my character. You can trust me. And so we're urged to return to the Lord for five reasons. And note, all five of these are tied to his compassionate character. Number one, he is Gracious. That word means the bestowal of unmerited favor by a superior to a needy inferior. It's used only of God. The idea here is God is always gracious. I like what Elizabeth Elliot once said, no sin is great enough to drain dry the ocean of God's grace. Friend, aren't you glad for God's grace? Amen. Secondly, he's merciful. Mercy means not getting what we deserve. The word is also translated as compassionate forgiveness. The Hebrews derive from a root word referring to the womb, indicating the strong feelings a mother has for a child. 
Ortland writes, it means his mercy's not calculating and cautious like ours, right? And most of us are like, I'll give you some mercy, but it's not gonna last very long. I'll just give you a little bit. Most of us are not good dispensers of mercy. We give it out carefully and measured, and sometimes we don't at all. Ortland says it means his mercy's not calculating and cautious like ours. It's unrestrained, flood-like, sweeping, magnanimous. <laughs> Notice next, he's slow to anger. This is a vivid Hebrew idiom. It literally is translated as long of nostrils. It refers to a horse snorting. Here's what it means. It means that God has a long fuse. And so people have ample opportunity to repent and return. This is captured in Psalm 78, 38. Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity. He did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often. And he did not stir up all his wrath. I like how one commentator said it. God is always more willing to bless than to blast to pardon than to punish, to win by love than to wound by lashing. <laughs> oh, there's more. Oh, worship with me as we consider this. He abounds in steadfast love. That word abound means great intensity. It's like overabundance. So we're called to return to God because he has an overflowing amount of love for people. The phrase steadfast love speaks of God's loyal covenant love. It refers to his unconditional tenderness, his kindness, and his mercy. Now to get this truth into our heads, the refrain for his steadfast love endures forever is used 26 times in one psalm. For his love, his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, may I commend Psalm 136 to you. If you have a hard time believing God loves you and he's committed unconditionally to you, read Psalm 136 for his steadfast love endures forever. God's steadfast love is not only abounding, it's also infinite. It's inexhaustible. Lamentations 3.22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, they never come to an end. Which leads number five, he relents over disaster. That word relent means to take pity. Ah, this goes back full circle all the way to the situation with the golden calf. Exodus 32, 14. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Ah, one last quote from Dane Ortland. The Christian life from one angle is the long journey of letting our natural assumptions about who God is over many decades fall away. Being slowly replaced with God's own insistence on who he is. This is hard work. Takes a lot of sermons and a lot of suffering to believe that God's deepest heart is merciful and gracious slow to anger. Now, because Jesus will return one day, we must return to him today. Now, there's a passage in the New Testament that brings the truths of God's character and our need to be contrite together. Here in just two verses, we see his patience and his power, his mercy and his judgment. God is slow to be angry, but his patience is on the clock. Why? Well, because the day of the Lord is coming soon. Well, let's consider then 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slow 
to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you. He's not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Then we read verse 10. See the word but? But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So like two beams of the cross, we've considered two truths that must be held together. Consider number one. Because of God's coming retribution, we must be contrite and return wholeheartedly to him. Words of Jesus, Matthew 24, 44, therefore you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect, which could mean that he comes before supper tonight. And so be ready, return now. But here's the second truth. Hold these two truths together. Because God is relational, we must believe his character and return to him. Check out Romans 2, 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and his patience, not knowing it's God's kindness that is meant to lead you to repentance. Oh, so it's both. The coming day of the Lord should lead us to repent. And as we contemplate his gracious character and his kindness, that should lead us to repent. We're called to be contrite and to believe God's character. And the cross is where justice and mercy meet. Listen to Psalm 85, verse 10 in the King James. I love this translation. Mercy and truth have met each other, have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You know, it's been a minute since I became an expert on water heaters. <laughs> One of the things I learned, I never knew water heaters have something in them. It's called a sacrificial anode rod. This rod is designed to sacrifice itself. Here's the idea. The contaminants in water are to attack the sacrificial anode instead of eating away at the water heater itself. Isn't it interesting that that's what it's called? Sacrificial anode rod. Now, in a similar but much much, much deeper way. Jesus has absorbed the corrosive qualities of our repugnant rebellion. When the sins of the entire earth were placed on him as our sacrificial substitute when he died on the cross. Amen. Friends, communion is a time for us to return to him. A time to come back as we remember his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and the quickly coming day of the Lord. We practice open communion at Edgewood, meaning you don't need to be a member of Edgewood to participate. You do need to be a born-again believer. And the Bible tells us that we're to take time to examine ourselves before taking the bread and the cup. So I'm going to invite you, close your eyes now. And as the Holy Spirit's been at work in your life, and he has been, you've either been listening or you've been stiff-arming him. Right now, just pray, Lord, if there's any hurtful way within me, if there's any, anything going on, any sin that I've not confessed, any th compromise that I've made, confess that to him. He's more than willing to forgive. He's eager to forgive. Cry out to him and ask for forgiveness.
I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, Child of weakness, watch and pray, Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Before the throne, I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raise this life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Well, we move now from communion to a time of commissioning as we send Emma Janicek to Mexico for six months. So let's give Emma a hand as she comes up.
I'm thrilled to be up here uh, with Emma this morning, and Emma's grown up in the church. She's the daughter of Mike and Trish Janicek, the granddaughter of Alan Cindy Trevet, and the granddaughter of Paul and Janet Janicek, and she grew up in this church. She's been involved with the children's ministry, the student ministry, and now Main Springer College and 20s ministry. Uh, Emma just graduated from St. Ambrose in two years, and uh, she will be starting occupational therapy, which is a doctorate in 2023. And so we're thrilled to have Emma up here and now she's going to be going to Mexico. And so Emma, yeah, just tell us a little bit about this opportunity and uh, how all this transpired and how this is different than last year when you were in Mexico. Yeah, so last summer I spent two months in La Paz, Mexico. Um, so I was with Phil and Patty Eager. Um, they have a youth and young adults ministry. Um, so they do a lot of discipleship with the youth. So I was like a youth mentor, just encouraging the youth to um, come to know Christ and know that we can glorify God in our youth. Um, but this time I'm going to go um, like two, three hours from Mexico City. I'm going to go to El Monte, um, which is a uh, Twofold ministry, so they have a cross cultural training program, um, which is raising up Latin American missionaries to go to the unreached people groups of the world. Um, so I'm going to be an English teacher with the cross cultural training program for the semester. Um, they also have a ministry that's like a retreat center, so people come and have spiritual weekend, spiritual retreat. Um, weeks um, and just come to know the Lord better. Um, so Paul and Roxanne Wilson came um, a month and a half ago. They came mid-May um, just to share about what they're doing um, and how Edgewood has been supporting them. Um, and one of their prayer requests was that a short-termer would come for six months and teach English. So I'm excited to be filling that role for them. Awesome. Yeah, we're just excited for you that you're following God in this way and mm -hmm. answering that call. Tell us a little bit more about the story of how all this transpired and how you had decided a long time ago to take a year off of school and all of that. Yeah, so I knew that I was going to get my bachelor's in two years, so I had extra time to be a person, I guess. Um, so I decided that I wanted to commit a year of my life to a mission. So I was looking for different opportunities to serve the Lord, um, to see different ministries, see how I might fit into different ministries in the future, and more or less just to learn from people who are living on the field um, on mission, hoping to preach the gospel to those who have never heard it before. Um, so I was looking for opportunities, and over the past two years, lots of things had popped up, and then other things had definitely closed down. Um, but in the past couple of months, it was a pleasure to meet Paul and Roxanne and that they had a specific need that I was able to fulfill um, in the year that I was already planning on serving the Lord. Yeah, it's just amazing to see. They were just here a few weeks ago and literally they were looking in the crowd for someone to come <laughs> and answer that call and, and Emma stepping up. So we're just thrilled for you. And Emma, just tell us a little bit more of this journey that you've been on. What has God used in your life to give you a heart for the nations and to serve cross-culturally in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lots of the teaching that I've had, um, so I've always gone to public school, never really like a Christian school, but um, as I've been in Edgewood, I've been in the youth, I've been in the Awana program and um, the youth group in high school um, and then Mainspring now today. Um, but all of what we teach is what the Bible says and the Bible says that he blesses his people so that all of the nations can be blessed. So all of the nations can learn about the truth of the gospel because we have the Bible. Um, so in Mainspring, we have done lots of um, retreats and we do um, different conferences. Um, but even in the youth group, we talk about missionaries. We talk about the importance of letting every tribe and tongue know the gospel. Um, so this opportunity I have, I get to be a mobilizer. So I get to help missionaries get to the field to preach the good news to believers that, or people who haven't heard yet. So um, I'm just super excited that I get to be part of that blessing of letting the nations know. And we're just thrilled for you. And that's just a great example for all of us just to be thinking and praying always about what God has for us mm -hmm. next. Emma, how can we pray for you and support you as your church family? 
Yeah, so I'll be an English teacher, so there's going to be English and Spanish in there, um, so communication is definitely going to be um, a big need for me. When I was in La Paz last summer, I definitely recognized the need for prayer in my language. Um, there were multiple times where I was just so overwhelmed by how I can't catch the Spanish as I wanted to, um, but the Lord did provide, and um, he does open those doors, so I just ask that you guys would be praying for that communication, and um, the missionaries will be using this English to learn another language so that they can proclaim the good news of the gospel. Um, so they are learning another language through the English that I'm trying to help them learn. Um, so it's just a really important thing that I communicate effectively. Um, I also will be there for six months, so um, just prayers that I would continue to be encouraged, continue to be um, digging into his word, um, and just learning more about Christ. Um, and then just El Monte, that um, we can be glorifying God well um, within the community, that we can be unified, um, and just pouring more into the community around El Monte. All right, thank you, Emma. Let's take some time to pray for her. She'll be around after the service, um, so if you want to talk to her more and encourage her, but let's take a minute to pray. God, thank you so much for Emma. We thank you for her heart for you. Lord, in this opportunity, God, that you've opened this door, and she's been praying about this for a while, and Lord, it, it, it really seems like this is the exact place you have for her. Lord, so we pray that you would go uh, before her, you would uh, keep her safe as she travels and starts living in a new culture. Lord, we pray that you would help her with the, the language. Um, and Lord, just going back and forth between Spanish and English is, I know will not be easy, Lord. So I pray that you would just help her. Lord, help her to grow in that. God, I pray that as she forms relationships with believers and unbelievers alike, uh, Lord, I pray that you would use her to be a witness there. God, I pray that you would keep her and the Wilsons and others working there unified and um, help them to just work together knowing that they are a part of something much bigger than themselves. Lord, I pray that as they equip and mobilize missionaries to go out, that you will use Emma in a mighty way there. Lord, thank you that you have provided for her financially, and God, you're just working and moving her life and being an example to many others here, Lord. So we thank you for her. We thank you for her example uh, for all of us, and we pray that you would be with her. And uh, God, at times when she's struggling, when she misses home, when she uh, feels far away from her church family, God, I pray that you lift her up. I pray that someone would check in on her, Lord, or perhaps she'll get a letter in the mail, just things that will help her to know that uh, her church family is still here, uh, her friends are there, and God, you are always there with her as she goes on this journey. God, we thank you for her. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Brian's going to close us up today. Let's just show our love to her. Just give her a hand. <laughs> Here's how we're going to end today. I'm going to invite two couples up who are joining today. And Rosalind, you can come up with your parents if you'd like as well. Come up on the platform. So there's Justin and Karen uh, Straup and Bobby and Belinda register. They're uh, joining Edgewood this morning, and I can't wait to introduce them uh, to you. Uh, two different, but you can come up here on the platform, uh, two different backgrounds which represent really where we're all at and kind of a continuum um, here. Let me start with Bobby and Belinda. Great seeing you guys. Yeah. So, little backstory, they moved here from Alabama. Correct. And God led them to Edgewood, and one night when I went to celebrate recovery, this is a couple months ago, I looked in the worship center here, and they were down front here on their knees. And they rededicated themselves to Jesus. You've gone through a lot of brokenness, a lot of addictions, and, and they just, right here, all the lights were off. Then you went to CR that night yes. and talked to you guys several times and, and most recently I remember you saying, I got all this sin in my life. I gotta make it right. So on Friday, they got married. <laughs> yeah, so congratulations. And they spent their wedding night at Celebrate Recovery. That's right. <laughs> so, and everybody there cheered you on. 
So both of them have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They've been baptized and they want to join Edgewood, right? Yes. All right, so let me turn over here to Justin and Karen and um, I'm glad R R Rosalind's here as well. You guys have been so well equipped in your Christian faith. You've been in gospel preaching churches, you're living on mission at home, in your workplace, you're a bilingual educator, you're a tremendous writer, uh, you're pouring into Joslyn, and you now want to join Edgewood as well. Friends, isn't that beautiful just to see? Yes. That we're, we're all in need of God's grace and God's mercy, no matter what our background. God's brought you guys here, God's brought you here, and together we make up his church. And God calls us to serve and to love him. You guys have been saved, you've been baptized, and you're ready to join. All four of them are committed as God allows them to gather with God's people, to grow, uh, to give what God has given to you, and then to go with the gospel uh, to those around you. So those of us who are members, if you're ready to accept them as members, signify by saying, we do. Yeah. All right, all right, praise God. I'm gonna invite you to stand, and I'm gonna pray for them, and then I'm gonna invite you, after we're done praying, to go down on the floor, invite the rest of you to come up and welcome them to Edgewood. God, we thank you for how you do your work. Uh, no matter where we come from, no matter what our background is, no matter our gender, our race, our geographical uh, location, whether we're far from you, close to you. Jesus, you came. You came to die in our place and to redeem us. And Lord, how beautiful that in the church, you then blend us all together, all for your purposes. Lord, now we offer ourselves, these four and little Jazzy, Lord, together, Rosie, for your purposes, for your honor and your glory, we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.